Good evening. Welcome back to our study of the book of Acts. Uh, we're in chapter 6, starting in verse 5. We'll do a quick review, rewind of uh, the first four verses of this chapter, this short one of the book of Acts, and then finish up this chapter. Uh, look forward to studying with you. Just a reminder, this Wednesday, uh, if all goes as planned, there are uh, plans, changes can be made, obviously, but uh, at 6.30, in lieu of a 5 o'clock study like we've been doing, 6.30 from the auditorium, Doyle will have his class. He's studying from the Psalms. Uh, it ought to be a great study. You'll be enjoying that. So uh, look on the same Hartsville Pike uh, Church website here on Facebook, but uh, you'll have that opportunity and successive Wednesday nights as well. So uh, for the foreseeable future, we'll keep the Sunday nights and look forward to studying with you. In Acts chapter 6, this chapter begins with kind of a, an internal problem in the congregation there, the church meeting in Jerusalem. So there are Hellenistic or Greek-speaking Jews, and it says that their widows were neglected in the daily distribution or ministration, some versions say. Uh, so the we, we would say they're essential. It's probably food uh, was given to ones who didn't have family support, didn't have uh, retirement savings or, or Social Security, Medicaid, anything like that. Uh, so we don't know why these widows were neglected, but some were. We don't know if that was a few or, or many. And so they bring that to uh, the apostles there. And basically the apostles didn't say, you know what, just a few widow ladies, they're not important. Uh, uh, we got bigger matters. We got bigger fish to fry. The church is growing and we need to get out and evangelize. No. Uh, they had the decency to say widows have always had a, a soft spot in the heart of God. You see a lot of those Old Testament laws, uh, provisions made for their care. Uh, and so that's not changed in the New Testament. You can turn over to 1 Timothy 5 and see a lengthy uh, discourse for the early church. Again, in a little bit different social setting than ours today about parameters for helping those who are widows indeed, not lazy. Uh, not ones who could be assisted even by family, but those who truly would be uh, impoverished without help by fellow Christians. But uh, the apostles essentially say this, it's not desirable that we should leave what we're doing, uh, the ministry of the Word of God, and serve tables. And so they didn't say the work is beneath us, uh, it's a menial task at all. It's just that uh, by the best use of our time and, and what God's called us to do, we want the issue to be resolved. And so here's the proposal. You select from among you. The apostle did say, we're going to handpick them. You pick out seven men full of the Holy Spirit, of good reputation uh, and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. And so they do that. And the apostles again say, we're going to give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. And so we see in verse five that the saying pleased the whole multitude. You know what, that may be one of the few times since the church began that uh, you could literally say that. This saying pleased everybody. Let me tell you, my experience in local congregations as a member and as a minister, it's hard to please everybody all the time. Uh, anything you mention, uh, we had the announcement this Sunday morning that in two weeks we're going to start having, uh, maybe the better word is reverting back to classes before worship. That time is 9.30 for class, 10.30 worship. Uh, a lot of people will be very pleased for different reasons. There will probably be some that say, well, I was just getting used to worship first, and I kind of like that, and I've just got used to it. And so hard for a saying to please the whole multitude. We are people that have different opinions and preferences, and we have to live in a time in which those are really elevated, and, and everyone's encouraged to uh, uh, almost expect that everyone's going to see it my way. That doesn't happen. All I'm saying is in this first century setting, yes, if someone's been neglected in, in these, uh, these essential matters, let's, uh, let's make sure. Look at the names. It says that they chose Stephen. Uh, I think it's not by accident that his name appears first. He's described as a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Well, one of the qualifications of the few that are mentioned is full of the Holy Spirit, so that doesn't surprise us. And it didn't mean, I'm convinced the others didn't have the, the Holy Spirit, uh, but, but perhaps he's more faithful, he's more fervent uh, in his, his uh, beliefs and his practice there. Look at the other names, Philip, he'll appear uh, in the chapter eight as well, Prochorus, Nicander, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas. 
Nicholas is actually here is described as a proselyte from Antioch. Now, these names are Greek names. They're probably uh, Hellenistic Jews, uh, ones who've been raised in the, the Greek culture. And so if Hellenistic widows are being neglected, wouldn't it make sense that we appoint over those, those who are uh, certainly from their background, uh, that would represent their perspective? Absolutely. And you've even got a proselyte here. He's not even a Jew, but a convert from, uh, uh, from being a pagan or Gentile, whatever that uh, background is. And they set them before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Let's talk about that phrase, laid hands on them. It's used in several ways in the Bible. Back in uh, the book of Numbers, chapter 27, here's a tradition that goes back to the Old Testament law. They laid hands on. Well, uh, it talks about them laying hands on Jesus to arrest him. That's not the meaning here. Sometimes laying on of hands could be conferring a spiritual gift. I think that's uh, true in, uh, in the pastoral epistles. Paul is, is reminding Timothy, is it 2 Timothy 1 of of when hands were laid on him. Here it could be that it's simply kind of a formality. It's, it's a way of singling them out for service. I don't know that a, a spiritual gift was bestowed. Now, one thing that works against that is what we'll see about Stephen in a moment because he is a, a performer of signs. So either had that before uh, his selection to do essentially the work of a deacon if it wasn't officially... Uh, the first deacons that are doing that. But uh, it could have been just a, a natural, not, not a supernatural, but an ordinary measure of a, a confirmation there. Look in verse 7. We've seen a few of these. We'll, we'll see some further ones. Kind of a report card or kind of a, a uh, estimation of, of where the early church was. It says the Word of God spread. Now, the Word of God doesn't mean the Bible got bigger. Uh, the Bible is the Word of God, but the effects of its preaching and its teaching and the conversions spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied, watch this adverb, greatly in Jerusalem. That's our dream, isn't it? Those that lived back in the 1950s, 1960s, post-World War II, uh, along with uh, other religious groups that showed some remarkable growth, we were, uh, that, that was some of the heyday, you might say, of uh, of uh, the 20th century at least, growth, congregations uh, expanding, baptistries uh, having water stirred regularly, uh, uh, new people added, Bible studies going on, and, uh, and so building programs. Uh, you look at different buildings that were erected in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and you realize we're not on that growth curve now. Uh, can that be reversed? I hope so, pray so. Let's keep working toward it different world today. Uh, that's part of it, I, I know, but let's never give up and say, well, that's uh, kind of uh, hoist that flag of surrender and say, well, we tried and uh, I guess it's just not meant for it to be. Part of it is our want to. So back then, the disciples are multiplying greatly, a great many, and I love this, of the priests were obedient to the faith. Priests, Jewish priests, obey the gospel? Yes. Someone estimated that there were about 8,000 priests in Jerusalem in the first century, about this time, 8,000. And so I don't know how many a great many is. It's a, it's a round number, but an impressive number. So that means that someone is teaching an Old Testament priest that now we're under a New Testament. And no longer would animal sacrifices be kosher. No longer would uh, the, these special days and, and these feasts that had been long-standing in Jerusalem be necessary. You see, because of offering the blood of bulls and goats, Jesus had made the perfect sin and blood offering. And so for these people to change meant more than just a cosmetic, just a little bit of an adaptation. No, it was a, it was a fundamental shift for them to say, you know what, uh, we're not even any longer keeping the Sabbath day. We're now observing uh, Sunday worship to a resurrected king probably cost them, in terms of family approval, uh, might have cost some of their marriages, incidentally, if you think about that. Uh, maybe, maybe children uh, abandon uh, their fathers. Friends, imagine, again, not being in that same social circle, but having a life-altering 
conversion experience. Many of the priests were obedient to the faith. I can read a verse like that and maybe mention that to a person I'm studying with who's come from a, a background in some denomination. It's like, you know what, I, I see what you're saying, and the Bible surely teaches this, and I need to do it, but what about my family? What about my friends? How could I possibly tell the church where I've been going that I'm going to make a change? These people did. They had to. We can relate to maybe some of the challenges they had in that. They're still priests, incidentally. First Peter chapter 2 says about Christians generally that we are part of a royal priesthood, holy nation. So in a sense, watch this, they were still priests, not Old Testament priests offering sacrifices, incense, not observing the holy days. Now, New Testament priests serving a God in, in a different way, but a meaningful way. And so we're part of that priesthood certainly as well today. Let's go on to Stephen, the last part of chapter 6 here. Stephen, one of those men selected uh, to be a, a ministering servant, whatever that was, officially a deacon or not, really doesn't matter. Uh, it's earlier said that he was full of faith, and here again that's, that's reiterated. He's full of faith and power. He did great wonders and signs among the people. I want to pause just for a moment on that verse and make an assumption with you. That is that uh, Stephen, who is not an apostle, got that power, that gift from the hands of an apostle or the apostles. Uh, that would have been a conferred gift. As far as we know, uh, you can make the case even for Philip. As he goes to Samaria and he's doing wonders and signs, uh, I don't think he could confer that gift to another person. I think you can make the case that, uh, th that whoever the apostles laid hands on had the gift. When they died, that gift died with them. These were in the days in which the church was in its infancy, growing. There would be the need for these miracles to confirm the teaching, this radical change in covenants. Once that had been established, the need for that ongoing gift would diminish. And I know people claim to be working miracles today. Uh, I, I haven't seen the, the evidence of the proof of that. God's still a powerful God, obviously. If he individually is working miracles, saving people's lives, whatever, that, that's his domain. I can't argue against that. I just don't think that people had that gift, and primarily because the purpose is no longer there. We have that confirmed word already. And so Stephen is doing these great wonders and signs. Watch the opposition. You've seen that pattern already in Acts, right? In verse 9, then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen. This was a probably a Hellenistic, Greek-speaking synagogue. A lot of these would be scattered around Jerusalem, little small pockets of believers uh, in the, the Jewish religion at that time. And it says they were made up of Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, people that are essentially foreigners that are transported. They were disputing with Stephen. Stephen very clearly is teaching about Jesus in the New Testament, the church. These people say, we don't buy that. We don't believe that. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit. I've got a capital S there. The Holy Spirit by which he spoke. And so if, it, if it's a debate setting, Stephen's winning hands down. Uh, they can't really answer him. So what do you do if you're defeated that way? Here's what they did. They secretly induce men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and uh, brought him to the council. Isn't that shameful? They realize that I can't debate or answer his logic, and so let's secretly induce. Uh, think about the deception. Here are people, supposedly people of God, that resort to lying or having one misrepresent the truth about him. Um, blasphemous words. Well, to them, blasphemy was saying that Jesus was resurrected and the Son of God. Uh, did, did Stephen intentionally try to, uh, to disrespect Moses or God? No, certainly not God. And all he might have said about Moses was great man, great leader, but... His covenant by none other than God himself has been abrogated. and So there's a change there. Uh, so they do this not to uh, 
kind of persist in a spirit of fairness at all, but rather to uh, uh, basically condemn an innocent man there. And so uh, in verse 13, they also set up false witnesses. See that again, the deception uh, saying this man has not ceased to speak blasphemous words against this holy place, this temple, and the law. For we've heard him say, watch this one, that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. You know what? There's at least a germ of truth to what they're saying there because Jesus, as in Matthew 24, Mark 13, I think it's Luke 21, had talked about uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. That would come about in AD 70. Uh, and so he wasn't blasphemy say, blasphemously saying that, but, but Jesus did famously say that. And the customs which Moses delivered to us, uh, Jesus had nailed that law to the cross. Uh, they didn't have to accept it. Many of them didn't, but it was true that they no longer were, were under it. And so in verse 15, it says, All who sat in the council, I'm taking this to be the Sanhedrin there, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. What a mysterious verse. Now think about what this verse says and what it doesn't say. Does it insinuate that Stephen's face literally turned into the face of an angel or that he became an angel? No. It's that word as, which is a word of comparison. It's a simile. His face was as the face of an angel. Someone says, I don't, I don't know what an angel face looks like unless it's my wife or my children. Uh, so we use those terms respectfully, lovingly. Uh, so what does that mean? I, I think it indicates at least there's a change in his appearance. Was it miraculous? Was it supernatural? Not necessarily. But, but there's something, maybe it's even the innocence there, that they see something unusual about his face. Now, as we get into chapter 7, Stephen is going to give an address. Call it a sermon, if you will. He's going to start fairly early in, in Hebrew history. Now, there's a purpose. There's a, a thread and a thrust in his message. I'm going to give you just a, a quick uh, kind of a preview of where we're going with this. He's going to trace, they don't know he's doing it in real time, but he's going to trace a history of persecution and rejection by God's people of their own. And he's going to culminate that with showing that Jesus is the last in a long line of martyrs. And incidentally, Jesus wouldn't be the last. Stephen was going to be the next. Stephen's going to die for what he says here that is truthful. And this chapter is also going to tie in an interesting young man that is holding the coats uh, of those who stoned Stephen. It's going to be Saul, ardent disciple of Judaism, Pharisee of the Pharisees, student of Gamaliel, who, as he hears this sermon, uh, it's going to be it's going to be moving to him. It's going to uh, be, be maybe the first installment of a change that is uh, going to take place in him. So, at this point, let's close with this: What do you admire about Stephen? He's full of faith. I can be too. If someone says, I don't, I hadn't figured it out. I'm looking to grow in faith. I wish I knew how, what's the button that I need to push I'm missing. A lot of it is just the dogged determination. I'm going to do right today. I'm going to read my Bible. Let God talk to me. I'm going to talk to God every day. Even if it's awkward, if I struggle with the words, if, if I'm learning how to pray, I'm still going to pray. I'm going to stand up against the world when it's trying to pressure me into doing something wrong or questionable. Faith is simply the little things that are really big things uh, that, that I do in a daily way to, to keep a close connection with God. Obviously, being in worship, taking advantage of, as you're doing now, uh, opportunities to study and, and sharpen uh, your, your belief in God are so important. Full of faith. He was full of power. We don't have the same power he did, but I want to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Ephesians 6 talks about as I put on that full armor of God. He's full of the Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit given to us, Acts 2.38, Acts 5.32, uh, as a down payment, a deposit. Ephesians 1 talks about that, a foretaste of what God is going to do. And no, that Spirit doesn't uh, whisper to me, make me do things against my will, 
Often I wish he would. That'd be a luxury if he could uh, help me uh, combat and, and be victorious over every temptation. He's there at my disposal. I have to constantly say, Lord, more of you and less of me. But as you think about Stephen, and uh, he's a servant. He's waiting tables for needy widows there, but, but also he's versatile enough that he's preaching and teaching when he needs to. Uh, he's debating. He's standing up for the Word of God. It's not always going to be a popular message. It wasn't in his day. It's not in ours. And then uh, maybe this last one, whatever it meant about him having the face of an angel, I want that too. I would like for people to look at me and say, he's different. Now, I am different. Some people are different in a bad way. I want people to see an innocence in us, a purity, a uniqueness in a good way. And, and we have a lot of control over that. And part of that is saying, Lord, help me uh, to, to make people interested, to make people hungry and thirsty for uh, deeper knowledge about uh, what makes me tick and how that's uh, based upon the Word of God. That's where we'll leave today. Thank you for studying with us. Look forward to Acts 7 with you next Sunday evening, Lord willing. God bless till then.